the sky is always there. You're listening to The Famine of Knowledge, which is a podcast. The Famine of Knowledge is the process of ending a conversation, which takes place over a great distance through the medium of voice over internet protocol technology, and instead of three independent voice recorders. I'm your friendly neighborhood, Steve Maher, and this is Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I am Shane, it appears. And we're also joined by Paul Tarby, Hello. Uh, our, hi. our special guest. Hi, hi, Paul here. It's 10 o'clock Helsinki time, 8 o'clock Limerick time, and 3 o'clock New York time in the PM. This episode get, guest speaker is Paul Tarby. In a few minutes, we'll ask Paul to talk a little bit about himself. For now, I'd like to start by thanking Paul for joining us uh, in our far casted studio, split into three different segments of time and space. Uh, that was a reference to Hyperion, uh, Cantos by Dan Simmons, by the way. Uh, we'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for their feedback in the last episode. I didn't think so many people would be interested in what we have to say, and I hope we can hold on to you as regular listeners. Uh, without further to do, further ado or further to do, I, I don't know. Uh, here's our show. <laughs> All right, guys, how you doing? Good, good, good. 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 Okay, I'm just going to get my PDF document up, which has our running order. And actually, no, instead I have a list of... Metal bands in Helsinki. Uh, <laughs> okay, here it is. Um, all right, so uh, this is our second episode. Um, so it's something we'd like to do with, 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 with the show is to have a guest. And the first guest that uh, came to, to my mind, Shane's mind, was Paul Tarpey. Um, Paul uh, and myself have collaborated on several projects in the past, most recently uh, with The Melody is a Message. Paul is a artist, writer, curator, researcher and educator. Um, he was an artist as part of EVE International 2014 with his project Making the Cut. Um, co-founder of the Spirit Store Project and her many other projects, Cat Dig, Packet and Tripe, uh, Poetry Depot, uh, and he's a researcher and lecturer at LSAD and the head of photography. Is that right, Paul? Yep, yep. <laughs> Some, right. Somewhere in there. Somewhere in there, I would call myself. Yep. Okay. Um, and I'm Steve. As I said last time, in case this is the first time you're watching this, I am a, I'm an artist. Um, and we're also joined by Shane Harrington, my co-host. Shane? Hey, uh, Steve and Paul. <laughs> so, like, it took me a while to get used to the last podcast, you know, like in terms of two of us talking to each other and knowing that we're recording it. Now there's another person. So it feels kind of like we're in a studio, but in different rooms or something like that. It's kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I, 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 I made this reference to the uh, Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons because there's like this in the, the poet story. Um, th this guy, he 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 gets very wealthy, and in this in this world, he can, like his house is is actually located in several different planets. Each room through this uh, through this technology called far casting, and I don't know why I'm talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> because you secret, but, you secretly wish it was real. I know. I just want people to know how intelligent I am and that I read. Oh, yeah. you read it? Yes, firecasting especially is a very hot topic at the moment. Yeah, and actually I didn't even read that. I listened to that as an audiobook. You need you need a ticker tape going across this uh, with, with references that you, you, you come across. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I, I, and I yeah. can do that with Premiere, actually, so that, that, wow. that wouldn't be too hard, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> or I can do some the SRT files. Afterwards. Huh? Maybe you can have like a bibliography. I could have a bibliography. We could have an actual website for the podcast. Mm. Some people do that. You could have. Yeah. Funny, you could have. Thank God for the power of editing. Well, you know? Yeah, I'm thinking of doing that. I'm thinking of. Uh, me and Shane were talking about using this uh, track for whenever I've made some really, really, really blatant cuts, which is the scene from um, Lost in Translation, where Bill Murray is selling that whiskey. Uh, what's it called, <laughs> Shane? The whiskey? Do you know? Santori. <laughs> Santori. Yeah, Centauri whiskey, and you know the Japanese director Centauri, yeah. is like kata 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 kata. I was thinking of maybe grabbing that and kata using kata that. kata. Yeah, like for for instance, there where Shane just did that really racist impersonation. I might bring in kata 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 there, <laughs> which is pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, it was it, it, it was pretty accurate. But then again, that character was 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 I don't know was 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 that car was that character true an to? Yeah, is that is that a Japanese director stereotype? I, I don't know. 
I, yeah. I don't know. I feel so, like, I feel like, we, I feel like she probably would have got some dude on the side who like actually is uh, that person in real life and probably got him to just be himself knowing the way they shot that movie. I'm a f- huge nerd for that. Maybe we should, um, bring the attention over to our guest though, Steve. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Paul, have you seen Lost in Translation? I have. I have um, in some sort of couch, half asleep kind of thing. You know? <laughs> Perfect. And are you for or I against it, it? I thought it tried too hard. Um, uh, oh, it the podcast be, is getting off to a good start. It, Shane, Paul? It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a good thing. I was just thinking there about, uh, have you seen David Bowie's uh, uh, Japanese ad? It, no, 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 but I've heard about it. It only surfaced. It's, it's quite... Um, he actually pulls it off, you know, it's like someone, uh, you know, you'd expect uh, a little bit from him, but he actually, you know, there's a little, you know, it's it's him, you know, it's him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part, I think the more, the more the people kind of begin to archive Bowie on the, um, after his death, um, all these things, it's, it's very hard to see uh, something that he wasn't being Bowie, even when he was... Yeah, even even uh, as the Goblin King in Labyrinth. Well, you not, know, not so mean, much, but the bits that are there. There's, there's a great bit. There's a, there's a, well, I think I think like he had a lot of creative input in, in in that thing, and a lot of people kind of shame people for like you know share, sharing links of Labyrinth. But that was a very influential movie for a lot of people, you know. And yeah, that, um, that mostly came up. You know, I mean, I was following. Yeah. I was following because I'm on the I'm on the uh, I'm on Facebook with a lot of writers that I used to read. Yeah. Uh, in the enemy back in the 80s you know and mm. um, they shared a lot of uh, articles that were quite hard to find and um, you know you see a different like hidden side. in the dark web yeah, kind of thing uh, yeah well not some bit like enemy uh, when you know they used to run maybe 50,000 word articles or at least 20,000 word articles you know some of the stuff that came out from those interviews were, was amazing like you know yeah and, yeah uh, it really is sort of part of his movie. and then I'm thinking about the other like um, there's a film called The Ruttles it was a piss take of the Beatles done by. Uh, I, I've, uh, I've seen, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what nobody's seen really is the Ruttles part two after the Beatles broke up. It wasn't a very successful uh, film, you know. But I it, haven't heard of that actually. No, I've never heard of it. Yeah. But it, it, in the um, in the DVD release, uh, there was uh, an interview with Bowie, and Bowie was playing a part, and they were they were taking the piss out of John and Yoko, you know. So um, he he talks about. Um, John, uh, this this character, whoever John played, and he says, "Oh yes, he tried to get me to do some like art stuff because his wife was into it, you know, and like uh, it was kind of putting a like living in in a bag or something like that, you know, and it was like Tesco and everything like that." And but he's he, like they had to you see the the chops because he was so serious that after a sentence, like I was roaring laughing, but you could see him chop because obviously he just broke down after every one, you know. But it was like, another, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was a beautiful piece of art. If you check it out. Um, it's just hilarious, you know, because it just takes the piss out of the whole kind of um, John Lennon being that artist kind of uh, scenario when he was uh, with Yoko, like the the bed the bed piece thing and all that kind of mm. stuff that uh, mm. he was doing, you know. But uh, it, like Bowie just took the piss out of he just ran with loads of kind of kind of art things and uh, uh, you know. You, being naked in the middle of a town and all this kind of stuff and oh, it's it's worth checking out i have to check it out myself again you know but um yeah but you know the internet archive of, of someone who's died like that i mean i think people are only you know the, the the definitive kind of bowie stuff is only coming out now about what yeah the thing i mean i could, I could go on for ages about the bits and pieces that came up you know yeah, yeah we, and you know the, sorry shane ah, I, I, yeah, I was just gonna say one of the things that came up here that just nearly killed me was a uh, picture of Bowie just walking around downtown and he like just totally dressed completely normal just like a dad just like sh- car- cargo shorts and like a baseball hat you know like he totally didn't look like Bowie and you look at the picture and you're like oh that's kind of funny that's a picture of him looking really normal but if you look closely at his hand he's just giving the finger upside down as he's casually walking because he knows he's being photographed and it's just it's it's hilarious. He just got this like total stern look on his face, but just walking like yeah, there, there, with there, his middle finger up. There was a woman uh, in an interview, and she gave a she moved to New York, and someone said, um, you know, you're living more or less in the same building that uh, uh, Bowie's living in, and she went, oh my God, you know, and they said, listen, you, you've got to realize one thing: she, don't mess it up for the rest of us, you know. <laughs> so it seems everybody in that area was like, you know, he constantly be out and like constantly don't acknowledge him, you know. And I think yeah. he knew that, you know. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The who, the who, the who had a. Um, 
uh, concert there uh, the other day and they put up uh, on the screen tribute to them and they called you know David Bowie great friend but son of New York and uh. that, was, that was good that was the first time that uh, Lennon had the same thing like I mean for the last years of his life he was New York he always wanted to be New York and so did Bowie yeah um, so that was you know your Vladimir your, Lennon <laughs> no, <John Lennon. laughs> oh sorry John Lennon you know but um, yeah, it's it's still going on. It was it was quite a quite a roller coaster of kind of uh, information about Bowie there for a while, you know. Similar kind of thing happened when uh, Robin Williams uh, passed, you know, and you had a lot of different uh, material that was resurfacing, you know. And uh, what's interesting when people like and um, people of that significance, you know, one who is such a significant significant comedian, one who's such a significant uh, musician and artist, is like. Uh, what how people relate to that you know in 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 the process of sharing links is this new form of 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 grievance you know uh mm. grief um where people um you know are posting links but you know it's also part of this assembling of uh one's um facebook uh an online persona you know so people do tailor their their grief and i mean of course like something like that isn't attached from cultural influences. Yeah, um, you see, previously, like when people uh, died before the internet and people famous died, <laughs> their obituaries would be building up for quite a lot. Yeah. And there was a kind of management implied with the media that they'd have, if he died, they had their stock thing. And, you know, it's famous. Some people were like, uh, their, their obituaries were printed before they died, you know, some people. Yeah, and you died. also have like these video um, obituaries that surface of people who are actually still alive from when they used to do that, they would produce things. Yeah. Uh, I think they, they used to do that for presidents yeah. even. But, like but now, had... now what's happening is that, like you say, Labyrinth with Bowie, and I, I think of like Bowie in the, in the 70s, um, and uh, all the Berlin kind of thing. So you can click on to mm -hmm. any cohort and get your feed of, let's say, Bowie in the 70s, but also you can click on to Labyrinth. So people can actually uh, tailor their kind of responses. They can just get into groups and say, well, you know, he's, he's like that. And eventually someone pulls it together in a good article and shows the range of it, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think of the, the time um, when, let's say, someone who was huge in the 30s, um, massively, it was one of the biggest stars in the world that started a lot of the kind of um, how we look at stars and receive stars was Frank Sinatra. And Sin yeah. Sinatra went up and down this down uh, down period where people didn't, you know, had written him off because in, in the 70s there was just too much other stuff to go on, you know, and then he had his wig and then his deal in Las Vegas. But I always remember the time that um, Frank Sinatra is, is sick and uh, he's going to die, you know, and I just remember reading something like that. Already they're stockpiling warehouses of the best of Frank Sinatra CD, yeah. <laughs> CDs. And then when he actually did die, it was just about the time that, you know, people were uh, saying, you know, so what, you know, about CDs. So <laughs> there was no big um, sales of um, <laughs> Frank Sinatra. Yeah, Frank's yeah, out. yeah. But there was loads of downloads from, um, from Bowie's death, you know? Yeah. So, so that's something that just struck me there about the nature, the nature of fame and uh, how it's packaged as your, your final thing. But it, it'll be, it'll be um, don't labor too much in Bowie, but I mean, he, he, he um, the notion of how to um, stage your own death, more or less, as as an art project. Finally, I think everybody recognised that. Uh, I that that was incredible. Much, there was. I don't think there was too much written about it because. Um, yeah. How, how how could you say? You could just say nothing but wow, well done, a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. Know? Yeah, I mean, it was for me like I when when the video came out for that second single where he's what's the what Lazarus was that that wasn't mm. Lazarus yeah mm -hmm. that's just fucking mind blowing the the way the lyrics lined up with the timing and everything it was insane like he he was saying goodbye through that music video it was uh, I mean like I'm not the biggest boy fan in the world but when I saw that I was like holy fucking shit this is this is intense. He was yeah, really they're, like, they're, it was a final art project, you know, like I'm signing off from life right now. Goodbye, lads. Yeah, but he, he, he did like he, he like I remember him in the 80s and he was on the Glass Spider tour in Slane and something like that. And he was just like, oh, God, this is terrible. And everybody gave Tin Machine a hard time and stuff like that. And so did I. I just completely ignored him. Mm. Um, but uh, then, you know, the Lazarus video came out and then someone put up a strange kind of gothic type uh, blog where, oh, my God, look at all these strange things from the 16th century or is this real? And, oh, God, they're <laughs> littered, littered all over the video. And did he do this himself or was it a fan or like the place mm -hmm. is going mad, like making these links, you know. But he, he did manage it in such a way that um, other people like he, he reclaimed his own um, 
his own legacy, his, his true yeah. legacy. You know, but not not as a musician so much, but just as the idea of a Bowie. Um, uh, he came out with the phrase, um, "The music will soon be like water." And uh, Bowie bonds in terms of selling your, your the idea of your um, you know the idea of your archive on 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 the. Uh, you know, in the stock exchange, basically. And just one quick mm. thing about Bowie Bonds, no, no, no one um, mentions, is that um, when he did put it up, he said that if you want to buy into it, uh, you donate a certain amount of money to this, and uh, you will get uh, points and royalties on the, the albums I sell. On you know? the returns, yeah. But, but for 10 years. But by the time that that ran out, and he got his 80 million and stuff like that, yeah. the downloading had just started. You know, so yeah. just, just he actually timed it very well. And you think himself. you think that he had some sort like I mean, if if he if he makes the declaration that music is like water, there's some sort of insight there where he's seeing how media um, and how media is being converted. Oh yeah, he, he saw it, he saw it, yeah. he saw it peak. He saw he saw its yeah. saturation point. He, he he knew from going and he, he fought long to get his contract back because um, he got screwed over in a few contracts and he took a yeah. long time to buy back his. Um, his music and he did that's when he started the boy bonds you know he, he's also I feel, I feel i feel cheap for bringing this up but uh did you see because it's it's fucking uh it's it's uh it's not comparable but uh was it the offspring sold their entire back catalog there um for recently 13 uh, million which is kind of yeah yeah which is not a lot of money but yeah i mean yeah but, you can, but they you were can, they, you... they were thinking i'd say the amount of time it's going to take to manage this yeah, you know, and also like um, the, how much their actual uh, downloads and how much downloads are devaluing. Mm. You know, when you look at uh, a lot of these streaming platforms and what percentage of profit uh, artists actually make from the royalties from those uh, streaming profits. Like, um, yeah, that's 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 the thing. They just said, you know, we, we'd rather be doing something. Yeah, else in, in a way, it's it's the wise move. Actually, you know? well, I'll just throw in there one thing I was thinking lately about when Metallica tried to take down Napster, did take down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And they said um, successfully. The lawyers and people said, "Well, you you can't you can't stop this downloading. The only way you'll you'll do that, and this is in the early days of this, the only day you'll you, way you'll do that for a legal case, in a traditional fashion, would be to uh, get the names of everybody who downloaded. You know, mm. and so and they took that a bit literally. Next thing. next thing, three <laughs> three uh, gigantic uh, artics came to wherever it needed to go, and they un yeah. they unloaded." you know millions of names on paper and i'm just thinking where is that stash now yeah that yeah. would be an amazing thing to <laughs> that find. would that would you would make a house out of that and i would make amazing paper mache with that it's, it's probably what um lars ulrich wipes his arse with i'd say every morning i'd say so yeah or they use it as serviettes yeah but, <laughs> well you know there's a lot of rainforest gone down to someone's kind of stubbornness there that's a yeah. that's at least that's at least you know five massive those trees in uh Ca in california Oregon, whatever they're called yeah you yeah, know, yeah. Now, now that they're back in the thing if they said we've just done this thing where we've repulped that and made it into houses for people in um whatever area uh you yeah know, <laughs> you know something something like that um you know, they could look at this. There's a, a he's not I, he's an artist, but he's not kind of on the art scene. But he he made you know this thing was up there a couple of years ago. He went to the uh, Irish, um, the uh, where all the money is pulped, and he asked for all the the, 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 the bits of shredded shredded money. You know, who's this boss? Uh, he's an artist. I forget his name. Uh, oh. But he he built a house. He built a house uh, <laughs> from the shredded from the yeah. shredded and he had it down somewhere in um, on the keys in, in Dublin and you could go in and visit and, and give a donation to what he did. But I've seen some pictures of it and it's it's quite striking because he's got paintings on the wall of this kind of mulched uh, billions, the billion pound house. Like it's just mm. worth billions kind of thing because he just roughly said how many sacks he got. So he was allowed to do it, you know, because it was only because mm. it was not it was it was the old currency. It was the punt. Well, or, not really. It's all no. money as well. When money gets worn out, kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Well, like when did he? When did he produce this it? This last about about two years ago, two or three okay. years ago, you know. I have it in some slideshow um, that that I show people for like, look, <laughs> mm. look what you can do if you're, you know, say you're an artist, and you know, I always say that annoy much to my students' annoyance. Like, if people are out there doing that at the moment, like, um, what exactly do do we stand for? Um, in, yeah. in our college well you know we're trained to do statements to justify things 
how they are and we can also say anything can be art kind of thing of course you know as long as it's properly positioned but I think he took uh, he took the decision for just to make it as a, a comment about let's say the Celtic Tiger or, or whatever just a futility mm. of things you know but um, yeah that's that thread there now <laughs> um, we can make a uh, segue towards uh, one of our first topics. Uh, so, and it's something we actually touched on there with that with that uh, section uh, is uh, p- 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 mediums, um, beta, VHS, MP3s, vinyl tapes. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, for me, growing up, um, like here's where I share an anecdote. You know, and it's something actually I was. Uh, saying to my partner there very recently was um like i think by the time i became musically conscious this is when the cd disc man was um the coveted item you know for 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 mobile listening you know but they were so so bad they just skipped you know i mean and but like the the obsession there wasn't with what was uh, good for my music pleasure for my listening you know and there were discmans that had like this anti-skip thing that like they had and it was rated in time because it would actually pre-record ahead on on the disc and then it would sync that pre-recording with the recording you were listening to that's how it worked um but i i could have probably and i had more tapes than cds uh, but the obsession there was with this emerging media, and as a child, you're very like kind of susceptible to this incoming media. And sh- there was only maybe uh, I don't know, like what ten years or to how how long was the CD dominant? Well, um, in the eighties, uh, it was uh, it was I think it was delivered around um, Born in the USA, um, Springsteen. That was the mm. first big rollout from that. And um, so it, it conf- sort of confirms the record company's idea of um, this ultimate uh, platform yeah. for music that was indestructible. That's the first thing I remember about it, indestructible. Yeah, and they, they, they totally were not because they most were of them were not degraded. They were absolutely not. And, you know, yeah. another thing, because I, I, was, I was still a tape guy then and a record guy. Yeah. And uh, never, I think I bought maybe maybe 20 CDs in my whole lifetime kind of thing, you know. And, yeah. Um, but uh, the, I have too many CDs. Yeah, but in I, I remember my going to shops alley. and see the amount of paraphernalia that you could clean your CDs for. You know, it is a completely yeah. kind of scam. It never worked. And uh, <laughs> I, I grew up in Mayo, and there was a guy who always had the biggest collection, and um, he had the biggest stereo system. You know, and sort of Mayo's answer to Disco Dom kind of thing. Yeah. Well, but yes, with CDs. yes. Uh, and uh, but I was just fascinated by the fact that he was one of those absolute cliches that literally got immediately all his albums and he'd be a classic rock guy mm. all the Pink Floyd all the U2 unfortunately and uh, mm. all the <laughs> everything else on CD as well as his, his rec- I actually wonder where his records went because you know he, he kind of changed his living room to accommodate his CD and CD racks as well like furniture for CD. Jesus man <laughs> so it the just, amount of CD yeah. racks that you see now in like there, there's a lot of secondhand furniture shops here in Helsinki and like I, I've been thinking for ages that I should hoard them and do something with them but also I'm not arsed <laughs> no it's, <laughs> you know? it's, it's something I think I, I'd be I'd be sad about giving that kind of era any sort of recognition I mean you can't go wrong with tapes because tapes are a democratic way of um, you know spreading music and and, and p- portable recording got got more bands out than sure anything else of course that, you know but you know, for 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 ourselves, myself and Shane were in uh, two bands together, and the realization that we could make our own CDs yeah. and the validity that our own CDs that we were able to make gave us as like kind of young musicians, um, because prior to home recording with CDs, it's almost like there was that moment in time where home recording disappeared because no one had uh, CD burners on their computer for no, a long well, time. I think you're, you're leaving out the mini disc there, um, um, Steve, because the mini uh, intentionally mini, mini disc was quite, quite, uh, that was the transition point. I have to say though, I did, you couldn't, you couldn't release a mini disc though. You couldn't, uh, well, you no, couldn't fold an did. A4 sheet. People did actually. I remember some mm. people, I, um, I remember seeing for a brief time, people were releasing USB sticks and they, that was the answer for like, 
a month. Yeah. They tried that. I remember no, going I remember into HMV. People releasing mini discs um, albums, not too many of them, but um, mm-hmm. also uh, I have to I have to say now I'm just remembering now I have about three CD burners um, units in my. I still have a mini disc in, 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 in my attic, so I was quite excited about the idea of you, you could record your vinyl mm-hmm. and make your own kind of mix CDs straight from the mixing desk or the mix the mixer into. Just in your DJing days, did you ever use um, uh, CD mixers? Um, oh no, uh, d- no. double disc mix- still, mixers, no. Like it's, no, I just didn't see. I didn't see the point. You know, I, you have to see it going around. Uh, it's just things that's been actually <laughs> taken away as well because the mixers have got so. Um, uh, like efficient that there's more buttons on the mixer to kind of loop and things it's more mm-hmm. because there's actually it's a USB stick now on the mixer that's quite quite that's hanging it all on its own so you come with your tracks on the the USB and it comes up on the mixer uh, uh, and then or it comes up on the CDJ and you can that's just it. grotesque it is yeah yeah I don't yeah. I don't see the I don't see the point you know um but you know, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm drifting off there. Um, but yeah, uh, no, that, burn, that's what the show's about. Burning, burning CDs was, was cool yeah. for a while. That was that was cool for a while. And um, it was great. Our first yeah. our first uh, demo was called uh, Cal Paul Conspiracies. And that was exclusively on the cheapest uh, CDR plus that we could afford. Um, and I think we did an edition of 20. Um, we would have done more, but we tried to spray paint uh, cover <laughs> on the disc. Um, but I, I was too impatient, and I kept picking them up to look at them. And of course, most of the paint went onto the uh, the mirror side of the of the discs. Yeah, that's... and also all of the all of the branding kind of came true because <laughs> it was all of this relief bra- branding, you know. So you could still see that it said like Sony uh, CDR. Uh, uh, underneath this like mesh of the cheapest um, hobby spray paint that I could get because of course this was before you could get graffiti spray paint uh, in Ireland um, so where, I don't know where I got it I think my dad had some stuff for uh, painting the the uh, the solid fuel burner at home or barbecue or something like that <laughs> yeah you should uh, but glitch CDs and kind of broken CDs was big in the in the kind of um, uh, high end uh, art sonic kind of way you know you'd have mm-hmm. guys like deliberately glitching uh, CDs or broken CDs or something like that but that kind of went down they went back to records kind of sticking them together and glitching them um, mm. but yeah it, so they still had they had their purpose but um, and there's that link that you shared with me there recently, this uh, French artist who does a lot of this uh, tape mixing thing. I can't remember uh, his name. I should remember because I've been watching that video uh, like every second day. But he's kind of uh, hacked a lot of... I think a lot of it's 3D printing as well. He's like 3D printed cassette covers and he's using like these... Um, uh, you know, he's like adding different like uh, dynamos to them. So he's like manipulating the sound that uh, is possible with the magnetic tape and stuff. Yeah, and but the, the, the thing about those ones is that the, the noises that they come out with are basically just replications of what scratch DJs do, you know? And um, mm, it's, that's it, true. It's, it doesn't transcend the gimmickness, I think. Uh, that's my problem with that. You know, it's, oh, that's great now, but, you know, uh, that's it, you know? I made my first loop tape there recently. Uh, I think uh, Hugh Butts saw that. That's right. Um, yeah, you must remind me. I have a loop tape as well. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, That'd I, be great. I, man. I was. I remember I tried to record on it a few times. You know, and um, <laughs> I kept going over the the sequence. You know, so I'd <laughs> yeah. like I'd forget. I'd forget it was only two minutes, and I'd be like, okay, here's five minutes. Oh, where's the rest of it gone? And uh, you know, just me totally. You know, it was about as. I remember actually slicing uh, cassette tape. And sell the taping it back, and then cutting it up, and then you know doing all these bits and pieces, you know. Oh, it's tremendous yeah, fun. It is, it is yeah. tremendous fun, and uh, but just it gave you control. I remember, like with cassettes, you know, uh, the idea of um, you tape off the radio. But then I got more interested in the bits where the voice would get cut off by the announcer and things like that. And then I, I thought the greatest achievement of, of tape things was uh, in 1986. I bought a, a, a tape to tape, and I well, I thought it was it was NASA basically. <laughs> you know, yeah. I had my own recording studio, you know, and uh, yeah. you know you could do. And then I got another tape deck uh, hooked up to the output, you know, so I'd actually just kind of DJ off the two two cassette tapes. I did that once in the in, in the college, you know, just it was kind of fun. 
I never had one, but it's something I always wanted was a four track, you know, recorder, uh, tape recorder. Oh, I had it would one, have been yeah. They're very easy, the, yeah. very easy to break, the Fostex. Apparently, yeah. there's very little of them that you can find now that are working. Yeah. But then, I mean, you know, I, I, it's a hobby I have is breaking apart uh, electronics and trying to fix it or do something with it. So mm-hmm. I'd be eager to get my hands on a broken one if possible. Uh, the la- for all the you last ones, I saw there. one in a second shop there a um, while back. The last ones, uh, no way, yeah. get, they, they had pretty high teched it up. There was a little mixing console on it that was better than the actual one, uh, just the pans and stuff like that. But you could do, um, I think it actually, you know, I, I'd say they actually did a mini disc one at one stage, you know. Mm, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I know that there were some like uh, task and mixing desk mm. record uh, recorders that had uh, mini disc input on them um, before they kind of moved over to hard drives and some of them also had hard drives and mini disc recorders or they'd have a separate uh, component that you could add like like the Commodore tape thing but for a mini disc yeah. uh, that you could have it on the side um, so yeah Shane what is your first experience what medium what is your what where do you where did you start you mean with it just in terms of like entertainment mediums and stuff like that, or yeah, record yeah. or recording? I mean anything. Oh God, I, I don't know. I mean, me and my friend used to record. I remember you just listening to you guys there. I was thinking, me and my next door neighbor, we used to record our own radio shows at tape. Oh, is that the stereo. Yeah, yeah. We used to record. Yeah. We used to make our own advertisements by just changing our voices and like clapping and shit like that. We would uh, we would make these weird ass fucking. Like uh, local radio shows, and um, they would be talking about the weirdest shit. And I remember just the feeling once when I when someone listened to it back that wasn't me. I was like, oh, what? Other people can listen to the shit you make. And I've kind of <laughs> I've seen that I've seen that reverberate, you know, like mm. out through my life later on when you you kind of really get into making something, and then there's the the showing it to everyone else. But but yeah, the disassociation. Kind of, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, and that's just kind of evolved from there. Like, I mean, I've I've always I've just followed stuff up. Like, yeah, I remember I was so thankful that my dad got into mini discs because it again felt like fucking. Yeah, your dad had a lot of different kind of tech in the house. He, he had did, a printing yeah. uh, room. He had a whole printing studio I, I guess, or something. I guess that comes from the the fact he was a politician and they wanted to get papers and stuff like that out a lot. A lot yeah. Of posters. Also, as an independent, I suppose he wanted autonomy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that's what it comes down to. That's the exciting thing, isn't it? At autonomy, you know, like when you, like when we, me and you made those CDs back in the day, we were like, shit, mm. we're almost, it feels like we have our own record label, you know, like we can just make this thing and give it to someone. It was very, it was very exciting. And it still is. It's still the most fucking exciting thing in the world. Like, you know, when you, you make some shit and uh, you package it and you can get it out there. It's really fun. Well, the, the big, I just jump in there. I, I, I did an interview with, with um, uh, um, Blind Boy Boy Club um, in the Rubber Bandits, and he was saying, I said, we'll start from the beginning. And he says, well, we made a, um, a, a CD of just messing, you know, like change. Yeah, change, yeah, that's, what, yeah. Change, that's where we first started. Yeah. So anyway. Um, we used to swap those CDs. Yeah, like, but he, you know, he, said, uh, he said it went like this very quickly. He said that uh, we, um, we did a tape for our class. And they're all loved it and says, you should give it to the other class. And he says, well, they won't get it. And he says, no, they'll get it. <laughs> and then someone said, oh, give it to the other school. And some people want it. And the other school won't get it. And they got it. And he says, next thing, Dublin schools got it. Yeah. 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 It just went boing, boing, boing very quickly, just from a couple of CDs, you know? Yeah, I remember talking to people about it in Cork. And they had the same discs, mm. you know? Um, I don't know how I ended up talking to them about it. But, like, you know, realizing that you have this common experience kind of like the Stuzzy S thing it's this you know pre-internet meme they kind of were they were they were like tapped into that zeitgeist before uh, any of us all, all we had was 56k computers you know no, there was no broadband there was no like uh, there was no torrenting there was no downloading you know movies to watch the next night or anything like not that I do that Sony Time Warner all, all you guys that are listening in <laughs> but um, you know it it, it, it it tapped into something there that we were pruned for we were ready for you know I, yeah. I thought the funny thing about the, the bandits one was that uh, the, the tapes became so or the CDs became so big and I think it just crossed over to YouTube. I don't know what yeah. things, but then like the, they said, like you know, you 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 need a gig, and they were like, for what? You know, well, people want to see you and the, the things. So yeah. 
well, we have a couple of songs, you know. So they just did two songs for this gig, and there was like, oh, hang on, <laughs> we, we need. To, well, they want more. Like, what do we do, you know? So uh, they started filling in and stuff like that. You know, just I just can't get over the fact that he was like, not so long in in his classroom making these uh, CDs, and next thing he's like. You know, heading for the Edinburgh Festival, you know, pure. But that's so organic, you know. It's uh, yeah, yeah but it's crazy. In, in in this day and age now, it wasn't too far away, so uh, it is it is quite significant, you know. But of course, the other thing, anybody tapping into that kind of culture now about you know, the tape stuff, or even like making like CDRs. If you read Wire magazine and you see these kind of tracking down these archives of. Um, when they, they do a profile of an artist and you see loads of like, you know, edition of 50 CDRs and people are, you know, you could easily get it on YouTube, but people want to actually go to eBay and get that mm. CDR. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah that, well, that, I mean, that, that's totally made a resurgence again. I mean, every independent, independent band at the moment, like it's about making tapes and, and limited edition CDs and like the album art and all that. There's a total return to actually supporting something that really applies to you. Like, you know, it's a, well, it, could, it, it solidifies their like fan base, their their, their true fan base. Yes, yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're, I think there's a yeah. deeper philosophical like kind of thing that's pulling people to it, though. I think that there's like a there's an alienation with the way that we're able to share media so quickly, and like to get meta podcasts are part of that too, you know. Um, but like you know the the ease at which you can access the music that you want that that like is actually quite uh, an alienating force and yeah people are are in search of this authenticity you know yeah, so yeah to, I, I, to gr- sorry i i was thinking i'd probably talk to you about the the trob and gristle tapes i used to i used to write over to trob and gristle in the 80s and, and get tapes and oh no uh, way <laughs> yeah yeah, it was yeah only, well, they, they, they communicate with me which i never really talk as seriously as i i, I do now the fact that yeah, yeah, yeah in hindsight that's it's historically like, oh, well, important you know, but not only not only not only did they respect the fact that a fan was writing over to a, a tape and uh, from freaking ireland tape. yeah but they had um they had a um a thing where there was about 30 uh, uh, cassettes in the series i got about 15 in the in the end but um they it's only lately i found out that um they would record however they felt recording the gig mm, because the gig yeah. was mainly was was all improvisation anyway and they'd react and bait the audience and and and, and uh, to get that as the kind of you know true energy. But some days they'd record it really professionally through the mixing desk, and another time they'd just take a, a, a beatbox around the back of the hall and just let it. So yeah. when I got the tapes, I never checked now because I unfortunately <laughs> gave them to someone, and you know you, you know you know that story. But um, yeah. uh, basically there was a one to five level of quality like they didn't so you get one uh, concert uh, and then it would be like four and some of yeah. those reference ones are only two you know and uh, yeah I remember, I remember one of those the Undle school where they were booked to play for public school boys um because they had coney van lututi there and they just wanted to see a, a girl yeah. on stage and you can hear this baying and primeval noise <laughs> and uh, the the music is just fighting against it and you can hear anything you know you just have to strain so i'm there like in, in mayo like listening to this <laughs> hell is going on and uh, it, it was genuinely because they you know they, they made a big thing about like psychically communicating their energy and stuff like mm. that and so you know if i had got that at full quality um, the music would have been foregrounded, and you'd be like, "Oh, I wish they'd shut up! I can't hear the music." You know, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. sorry, sorry, noise. Yeah. Um, but the fact that I wish I had that tape now because it was, it was almost like being transported, really transported back into the um, to, to the to the kind of strangeness of that kind of gig that it was. You know, and that, I that wish I bought a gristolator when they were cheap because now they're fucking. They cost a load. I remember seeing them in Tower yeah. on one of my trips to Dublin. And that's twenty quid. What is that? That's Do you a, have that generation. book, Steve? The the records of civilization. Uh, the Trapping Gristle. No, you can get it pretty. No, cheap. but I think we talked about it before. It's well worth getting, you know, because it does it does uh, lay lay out the, the complete strangeness and and the underestimated uh, kind of sonic. Uh, stuff they were doing at the time, you know, they had the studio and everything like that. And, and your man uh, Chris Carter used to the amount of stuff he'd make, like you know, he just make loads of things. Yeah, that 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 reminds me of something pretty interesting and and uh, and uh, timely is we were just saying there about the you know how easy it is to to make shit and uh, and get it out there. And you look at someone like Trobbing Gristle back then when they were doing stuff like that. A lot of people these days, a lot of like just young creatives mistake 
the tools for the actual substance like there's like oh if i'm doing something it's it's kind of you know that's all that matters but in in a way you know there's like they kind of want this professional sheen on everything whereas mm. there's a lot to be said for something like a tape where you're recording half the bloody audience you know like and uh, it's totally lo-fi and stuff like that you see that in visual art too yeah. like i mean well i so think it's much... completely i think you're right steve i think it's completely led from the fact that some people are pretty um uh quick doing video um, editing and stuff like that and they put up sort of uh, things with a sheen on it even if they're just chopping up a, a, a film uh, or making uh, you know these kind of um, uh, fake trailers and stuff like that there's one, there's mm. one from Marvel and Trump at the moment have you seen that? Uh, no, no, no. Ch- check it out it's, it's, it's high class very good so, I saw the Game of Thrones Trump uh, yeah, thing but you see, took his but head. so people are watching that then and they're kind of oh I'm in a band as well as things and, and they think it's so easy to get that kind of sheen and mm. the fact that it took two days uh you know that that's enough it's the aim for the sheen before anything else and even if yes it's lo- exactly even it's lo-fi you know it's like it, the it's, music is, is, is the sound the sort of integrity that's supposed to be with sounds is kind of subsumed into this kind of like just kind of just 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 doing it you know yeah yeah well that's the thing there, there's a huge obsession especially over here with your fucking brand you know like it's like it's it's 98 percent brand and two percent substance when it should be the other way around you know people are it's but, but they celebrate that you know they, they celebrate that and the, the media are trying to catch let's say i suppose the guardian and downwise you know they you know mm. they, they would click on to something like that as in just keep it turning over so we've something to write about you know oh for sure yeah it's self-perpetuating like this good looking guy with a mad haircut you know just took some time out from serving in a crazy bar downtown and he actually made a song (laughs) i didn't think it was going to come to much you know my friend said you know you'd be good for fronting this you know and sure Mm. so the things you know i have to say the sealford mods should come in there uh, at the at the at the moment they um you know i saw them here in limerick and you know two beer crates a laptop two cans of beer and uh, just a mic <laughs> and uh it was just brilliant absolutely brilliant you know you know i know come here have you have you heard about quadrophenia too by the way I know unfortunately I, I, have, yeah. Yeah. I, ha- I have not no. you. <laughs> yeah man yeah so well, that's, that's but it's, it's fucking kickstart- reboot culture it's- it's kickstarting. I think it's a bit sad because the the guy. There's loads of people. If you watch the film and and you know you you, you live through this, the 70s and TV and 80s like I did, um, you, but I saw Crawdafinia late and I've got oh there's your man from the bill oh that guy's in Coronation Street oh yeah yeah guy. and <laughs> there are actually the, the the publicity for this that guy's Sting in, in, in the well Sting yeah no one mentions that okay Steve you know, you know the rule there no one mentions that. But um, I, I, I I don't I don't I don't care. But for this, uh, anyway, uh, the, 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 they're, they're actually, they're actually it, it, <laughs> it's uh, I don't know if it's sad or good, but the Kickstarter thing has one of the guys uh, in the bill, and he's older now, and they have him in the parka. And yeah, so I saw the, I saw the, at least there's they're trying, uh, yeah. to, they're trying to fund it, you know. Um, yeah. Well, actually, they're they're also if you do kickstart uh, join it, um, you can get a chance to win a Peter Blake. I think maybe the Who or somebody donated a Peter Blake kind of uh, artwork you know you get a chance of winning that you know so no. I, I think the intentions are good it's it's about a guy being bullied and um, you know it goes back and gets the mod but you know I mean we, we have this as England you know I know it's not it's it, you know I know it's skins and not mods or whatever but like you know that 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 trope has been covered and covered quite well we we you know I mean and that, like that, that that was. Well, I know it. The, that film is now what, like, fifteen years old? Like, I think this is England. Well, is it? T- was t- was TV- 2004, 2003? TV series. TV, TV series, though, isn't it? Still going, still going. Yeah, I think he. I think he ended it now, though. Um, yeah, when people got fed up looking at how good the costume design was, it was all over, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they 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 tracked all the way up to rave culture, you know, and uh, yeah. that's um, that's pretty fun, you know. Um, yeah, uh, I picked up a book today actually um, in in a second hand shop. Uh, it was a sociology book about straight edge, uh, hardcore punk, clean living, youth, and social change, by Ross Hainfler. So I might talk about that in the next podcast once I 
read it you, or you pretend need, to you read need it. You need to read the Henry Rollins book. The Henry Rollins. Uh, book. I saw. I saw the orange it, one. Yeah. yeah, that's that's mm. that's a good one. Yeah. He he's incredible. He's an absolutely uh, singular human being. He's. I don't think I'd get on with him though. Yeah, I, I thought so in the beginning. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to hang around with him for more than two days. But just some of, yeah, some yeah. of the speeches he has and some of the stuff he said is just. So oh, I admire him definitely. That, that, that you stuff know. he wrote. Um, Paul, are you familiar with the the piece he wrote in the eighties called The Iron? It was about working out of all things. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that time when he was um, big. I remember. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I remember he was he was doing a lot of that. Yeah, that 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 particular text like ended up on the walls of a lot of gyms and all that, but it eventually made its way into a lot of recording studios as well because whatever's at the core of it is just so applicable to life in general. It's. Do you see the collaboration that he did with um, what's his face from Star Trek, uh, from the original Star Trek, William Shatner? No, <laughs> I, I I just can't get behind that. Oh yeah, oh yes, check, yeah, yeah, yeah. Check yeah, it yeah, out. Exactly. Yeah, there, there's a really nice video of that where it's two Muppets uh, synced to the. They did an album. Yeah. They did an album. Yeah. William Shatner and him did an album. He, he just didn't really say no to a lot of things. He was just like, I'll, I'll bring my own thing to it. I think he's on, what's that TV show about the bikers as well? Uh, uh, Orange County Choppers? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, the one, um, Sons of Anarchy. That's that's Hulk Hogan, I thought. He, he's, in, yeah. he's in Sons of Anarchy as like some neo-Nazi dude, bad guy, I think. Oh right. Yeah, he, okay. he, he's done a lot of films, really. Um, yeah. He was the, the kind of. I, he didn't have. He reminds me in a way, little, little way um, when he did his, when there wasn't the internet and you'd have to find out from various magazines and he'd be off the scene for a while. Then he'd come on. But he, he reminds me a bit of uh, what his, you know, trying to get into different things. And I, I th- don't think he's kind of career orientated, but you know, he's, mm. he does have his thing. He reminds me a little bit of Zappa, um, but he doesn't have that complete. You know, Zappa would never touch anything. Yeah, yeah. He, that he didn't feel comfortable with, and in yeah. fact, if he did, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm always on Steve uh, about Zappa uh, playing the mm. playing the part in Miami Vice, which is just hilarious. <laughs> and he just knew I'm going to be hilarious in this, so I better be straight. As <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he would do. He would always make sure to do something. Was like, oh, that's so unusual. But Henry, you know, he'd go into it, and then he'd stay too long. I think. Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm only being I'm only being almost facetious in that because no, but, that, know, but that's how, true. How, how can I comment on a man who's just kind of just doing so much creativity you know yeah yeah but they're, they're very they are very different i mean like the thing is with that like henry rollins just doesn't have i mean his maybe his spoken word but he doesn't he's not really like uh, a flourishing technical musician or anything like that like frank zappa owns no. what he does with music very well but zappa owns yeah, projects I mean, he, he like he'd, he'd make sure but you know henry would go into the sons of anarchy and say what do you want me to do zappa would never yeah do that. yeah he'd yeah. say if you want me you better do exactly what i want you to do you know and yeah. yes, I, I will fit in. Like the monkeys fell. Yeah, Zappa was far more uncompromising. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Rollins is still mm-hmm. around. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. It's. Uh, it, it's. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna create dead air now by talking. Dead. Not have, not saying anything. Dead air. <laughs> let's let's bask in the dead air. See how long we can last. Uh, <laughs> um, let's uh, let's make a segue. Um, Let's talk about uh, New York hip hop. New York hip hop. Where did it go? Where did it go? Um, mm. You see it a bit on, on online, and uh, when did it get like this? And I always just say, Puff Daddy, you know, there you go. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Come yeah, with me. It, it transit. I've been actually listening to a lot of um, about 90s uh, New York hip hop at the moment, and I'm just really blown away by the amount just before it ended, like people like Large Professor and stuff like that, what they were doing with. with um, using the template of hip hop and just you know it all sounds the same but you could hear the amount of production that went into it you know mm, yeah and um it just wasn't tighter crews i think in the end but the underground new york hip hop was well there until 2000 you know just still, mm. still good shane has had some run-ins with uh like hip hop artists in in the bronx and uh not run-ins. I mean, he's worked for some people. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Shane? <laughs> yeah, we, we get into fisticuffs and shootouts. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, there there was some dodgy moments by your own account. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's yeah, it's interesting you say Puff Daddy. I mean, that's the thing. The underground, like the underground hip hop or rap scene in New York at the moment. I mean, a large portion of it is deeply influenced by gangster rap and bling bling and stuff but it's a lot of people who can't afford the stuff they're rapping about saying they have it you know which is uh, well you, you you know the 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 pinnacle of jay-z actually being you know less i did deal drugs and you know my career is based on this kind of 
pinnacle of like the same sort of hierarchy how I did drugs and you know it's kind of mm. legitimized when he when he did his um, that huge rollout for his uh, his biography where they kind of had it you know about this they did they did no um, did a massive launch where they tied in with social media so they put his lyrics uh, in extremely like high end kind of posters huge things and all the places he rapped right. about like you know you, you come down the street one day and there was a huge cadillac just painted with his lyrics and oh was, nice at, yeah. at the time so you had to collect them all and you'd share them and whoever collected them you know got to meet jay-z or something like that but at yeah. one stage they did um like his lyrics were underneath tiled underneath a, a, a swimming pool in in in, in florida <laughs> and all that. so but you know i was looking at one of them and it was talking about his kind of drug dealing days one of his raps about that kind of thing you know and it's like yeah. high high end you know it's, everybody's completely okay with that you know in the industry because you know it, it says you know you're striving and i'm sure yeah. that younger people go like well you know that there is it's it's okay to, to you know to have it kind of at one level at the street mm. yeah, and but you know i wonder how never, how never far it, on you know? after can yeah. you speak about like your well jason you always, you always what's the limitation on it jay-z jay-z you know J legally J like you know? can you be can it be used as like I mean, well, you see, this is the thing. Is the that, thing but... By the time he got so big, it, it wasn't worth going after him because, um, or worth even yeah, more going there after is, him. There is, there is a couple of incidences of um, well, so, so, so... bragging about bragging about what they did, and the cops are using that the videos as evidence. Yeah. There's a couple of incidents. That's why I brought it up. I've heard about that yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah, and they're like, "Why? How did you find out?" Yeah, but very, very recently, <laughs> very recently, Fifty Cent posted a picture of himself. With a bunch of stacks of hundreds spelling out the word broke because you know he's meant to be um bankrupt and uh he, yeah. was, he was called to court for posting the picture which is pretty oh, fucking hilarious yeah yeah oh, how, how could it, but um, I, so, you, you I, I, saw, I saw him there, like. i saw him on tv on a, um, a severe business channel and he was like in a suit completely articulate saying about his uh, water business <laughs> like, you know, his own yeah 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 and, like and he was saying well you know the trajectory for smart, basically what we're looking water. at yeah Jesus, it's a far cry from lads turning off their Facebook um, like uh, page so that the dough, ca yeah, like the, yeah. the social welfare, can't catch you because you're going off to the UK on a tour and you're not going to make any money and you've saved for this for like half the year and but you have to turn off your Facebook so that the department. Well, there was there was a there was a great one lately. There was two brothers who got off. They were uh, drug dealing or something like that in England. You know, they were basically um, two thugs, and they, immediately they got bail or something like that, and they immediately went on Facebook giving out about the judge and how stupid she was and everything like that. So they used that immediately and threw them in jail. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Like they heard about that. There was that girl. Uh, I think she was originally. Uh, I don't know her name, and maybe it's not important to talk about her, but. There was an artist, I think, an Irish artist who um, was on the so was on the live, the register um, cla claiming welfare and was actually having quite a successful career in a sense. I mean, she she had won awards and things like that, and she was working in London as a creative, you know. But she was she was because the flight between Cork and London was so cheap, she was flying back to sign on every every two weeks or how like um that's how detached i am from that because I, I i've i was only around the part-time allowance yeah thing. waterford whispers has a good one there lately about some guy over in thailand saying it's just really wrecking him having those long distance <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and you know and, and waterford whispers are getting quite good now and you still get a few people going like oh that's disgraceful you know how, how could that yeah do it, you know? i <laughs> know yeah, yeah um i'd like to talk a little bit about my project coming up um in helsinki uh, I just had a very, very good meeting today about it with uh, MCult, who are an organization here who have a calendar of um, socially engaged projects and media projects uh, in Helsinki. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, have I talked to you, have I told you guys much about Heavy Metal Detector or um, have, have you know the premise? No, I like the picture though. I like the picture. It's good. It, it, it's it's like Ron Seal, Paul. It, it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a It's a... Metal detector that detects metal and plays metal once it detects metal. It still metal. looks like you're looking for bodies, though. I might be, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, at least the metal of their fillings or something, you know. Steve, yeah. Steve, what, what attracted you to the, to, like, just knowing you growing up and stuff, what attracted you to metal 
like exploring the whole metal culture and stuff in recent years because you weren't the you weren't the biggest metal guy I know. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was more into punk and hardcore and pop punk initially, <laughs> but um, I suppose like it, it's it's like most things from when you're younger. It's like uh, any interest now I have in hip hop. For a long time, I had. Uh, these feelings of like distaste for uh, other genres uh, when I was that age and uh, didn't experience so much of that stuff. And I, 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 to be clear, like I'm still not into metal as a genre. It's not my taste. I, I like other other music, but I do find the subculture really fascinating. Mm. Um, you know, and um, as someone who works with musicians as part of my work, um, you know, I think that it, it's a fascinating group of. Uh, of people to collaborate with on so the idea with the project is that uh there will be several several of um helsinki uh usama regional metal bands you know vanta espo helsinki metal bands and we'll make a compilation and the metal detector itself is actually a tool for disseminating the album so it's it's about basically um uh, br- breaching these uh, cr- like this crush genre divide, you'll have a lot of people who are engaging with the project who probably are quite divorced from that type of music because there's going to be some like pretty visceral stuff. There's going to be like a lot of trash stuff. There's going to be a lot of death stuff, and of course there are, like I I like progressive metal. Mm. Uh, there will be some progressive metal there too. I'm really leaving it up to the bands though in terms of what they're contributing, and that's part of this co-creative kind of. Um, thing is that they, they, the project is described to the bands, we're working on the co- contract at the moment, um, and you know, the the directive for them is the conditions in which their music will be listened to, you know and they're like most bands I've talked to are actually quite excited about it, you know uh, it, it, it's good, I have a, a few bands that are confirmed now um, one band uh, for instance is this band called Nuclear Omnicide who I have um, <laughs> I've, they're they're up on my Great Facebook name. chat. Some fantastic names, yeah. some very very good names. Yeah, it's a wonder like, they some... haven't run out of names because. Uh, yeah. I think if anything, they must get more creative because at the rate that metal bands break up, like yeah. <laughs> because they break up <laughs> so quickly, you know, um, like uh, that's one thing I found while trawling through these online resources for bands like that. Half of the bands I've contacted. Are, are splitting up or are in the process of splitting up or have split up uh, <laughs> so like you know it's, it's just this few uh, core group of people of bands that are actually still together you know um, that are not like uh, jumping right into like something that's quite dramatic where one of the bands I'm talking to at the moment uh, I contacted them on Friday and they have they split up <laughs> like yesterday <laughs> and so now I, I kind of don't know I'm, I think I'm in the middle of a fight uh, between band members on their Facebook page uh, by accident which is kind of interesting um, so like these are the kind of things you can reflect on after with a socially engaged project that are qu- it's quite interesting um, I think I think uh, An- Anvil you have you seen a film Anvil oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 you know such a good that movie, was yeah. that was uh, I think I think it's still and the the um, the uh, what's the civil the the, the civilization um, two films there um, oh the, the, the um, yeah the the ones from the guys that did what are they called well, oh. the female the female director yeah. um, uh, who did the uh, just uh, documenting the LA sort of punk metal scene yeah. Uh, back in the things, uh, decline of the Western civilization. That's the one. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another one called Heavy Metal Parking Lot. Have you seen that one? No, uh, but that is now going into my notebook because it, it's the same titling process I used. They went back and tracked all the people like uh, 15 years later, and um, they're all in the same town. They've all kind of settled down, and they're all kind of really friendly and everything like that. It's oh, just wow. to see the, oh wow! Oh wow! Have you seen the Fugazi documentary, Paul? No, no, no. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Really- we we, yeah, we great. the first band me and Steve ever saw was Fugazi and one of us bought the the documentary at the show. We were, we were like sixteen yeah. or seventeen or something. Wow. We watched it. Bought... We watched it that night, like while still soaking wet after being at the show. It was yeah, like oh, being great. Uh, I, that was an I that bought was this video, uh, yeah. vegan cookbook, which I, I think I came out the better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, the, like just speaking of bands that like, um, you know, like the way you would write to Trubbing Gristle for those tapes, uh, Fugazi recently released a whole entire back catalogue nearly of their live shows, and the Limerick, yeah. show, the Limerick show in the Savoy is on there. 
Wow. Is I it? I heard that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I must have checked that I mean, out. I heard, I heard of it, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just, I just um, when Lemmy died, um, people were saying, oh, is it true he played in Limerick? And he did, he played with Hawkwind, you know? Oh, really, was, yeah? So, what so, venue? Mm-hmm. In the Savoy. Uh, oh, really? Jeez. In 1970, like everyone else. 1973. Yeah. But um, I found that uh, at that gig that Barney Bubbles, the designer, he had this kind of fanzine. Uh, it was kind of an extension of the record covers. And uh, they were placed on all the seats in, in the Savoy. Um, so anybody who nice. that is like just amazing. It was kind of like a manual for these kind of space time travelers. Oh, cool. So, so uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm making my project Heavy Metal Detector coincide with this. Um, well, it, it's in the works, so uh, don't don't hold me to it. But there, uh, Lemmy visited Helsinki uh, last year, and he starred in this uh, in this Milk. Ad, um, <laughs> uh, and I know some of the people that produced the ad actually who work in advertising here. Um, but the the community in this area, he the ad was shot in Manila, which is where the um, heavy metal detector project will be based out of, and uh, we're trying to somehow kind of connect it to it. But the launch date, you guys will like this. It's on the sixth of the sixth month. Oh yeah, two thousand sixteen at. 16 uh, on 24 hour clock <laughs> o'clock. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 16, 16, 66. No, 16, 16, 16. <laughs> 16, 16. 16. Uh, 6, 6, 16, 16. There's six, it's close enough. There's sixes in there. Yeah. It's pretty good. There are sixes in there. Uh, I'll you know. just throw this quickly in there, Steve, just to bring you back to Limerick, is that recently there was a, a front page picture about Willie O'D and um, his, he was contacted by a woman. Could she help him out? Could he help her out? And uh, it was about her her um, welfare card, or I think her child's uh, her child's welfare card. And right. she, she it ended with the number six six six. And um, she wanted to change wanted it. To change it. That's not really Fuck the story. It, the story that made the that's paper fantastic, was the fact though. that Willie contacted the health authorities to see could they do anything. Oh that's my not, god! That's not that's not even the story. He did it twice. <laughs> after, after, this, after, this, after they told him to go away, you know, she was saying that it's it's like because it's got satanic uh, connotations, she didn't want it on. Could anything, you know? Wow. Uh, right. But, um, That's phenomenal. You know, my child, my I, I child think, has the I, same six 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 on his, but we we don't seem to be too bothered. I think. You know, so. <laughs> I think as well. Actually, it's not even the number of the beast. It's uh, I think depending on what Bible it is and what first that quotes about the beast. It like on the King James, it's like uh, six six five or six six four or something like that. Or so. six six seven, the neighbor of the beast, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know this thing, yeah, the, the noisy neighbor of the beast. Or twenty. Or and, acro- and across the road is arbitrary number. Twenty four. Yep. Yeah. Well, nine. Continue. <laughs> four. That's seven. Twenty four. Again, twenty three is a big number. Burroughs had a big thing about twenty three. He wrote a lot about the number twenty three. Um, Why was that? I don't know. He, he he was able to link it to various kind of esoteric um, Egyptian uh, various old civilizations. The number twenty three kept recurring, and uh, he made this whole thing about the number twenty three, and uh, had a few people on on, on it uh, convinced. Yeah, him. I need to look into that more. You know. Or maybe not. Yeah, I mean, the, honestly, the only thing that I have experience with, with Burroughs is like Naked Lunch, and it's not even the book. It's like uh, the Lynch movie, you know. So it's kind of oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just being honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, he comes up every ten years. He's big at the moment. Uh, he's yeah, big at the he, moment. Had, he had a, he had a show over here recently. Uh, oh. where it was a, it was a selection of his photographs where he. Oh yeah, that was over in England. Yeah, that was over in England. Yeah, too. yeah, taking a bunch of photographs, putting them on glass, and then lining them all up, and taking the photographs again, and then doing the same thing again. Um, but his yeah. paintings, he used to paintings where he shoot them. He put balloons of paint on, it and um, he'd he'd shoot them. Like with um, a with a handgun or something. With a rifle and uh, air rifle or something yeah, or yeah, yeah that, that kind of thing. So he was he was doing that as well. Nice. I suppose they looked like cracked eggs. Is that the point? I don't know. Or... Never, people never got into those. I think. You know? mm. um, so yeah, that's kind of that's under things. Um, I think mm. his cut ups in his paper things. I'd like to see those. No one's ever got those together. An actual yeah. exhibition mm. of of because once they were, I suppose Simpsons. The Simpsons did a parody of that. Mm-hmm. I think uh, with Mo, Mo Sizlak, like that. Uh, 
you know, Lisa discovered it's like it's a later Simpsons, so no one has probably seen it. I don't even. How is it still on? I have no um, idea. Who, how the fuck is that? Are they making those episodes? I think they must have some like infinite contract or something like that. You know, Fox just signed it, and they can just make them forever. But I'd say their ratings are actually still quite good yeah, in terms of like TV ratings today are very low. You know, so. They probably still hit that right demographic where, like, they're still able to sell advertising at that time, you know, because it's still prime time. Sunday, six o'clock, it's always on. Yeah, you know. No, I just saw it there now. It's like the Frank Gehry one was on. They they had a just to uh, to to give themselves a, something. A, Marge wrote a letter to Frank Gehry, and he just rolled it up and crumpled it and threw it on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Oh on yeah, a yeah. Second, and then the brilliant opera center, you know. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just okay. Yeah. Nice. Dead air. That's dead air. That's dead air. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we were conscious of not letting it ramble too much, you know. Um, yeah, so that's good. Well, the the problem is like eventually when it when any recording runs on for more than an hour, eventually or intake of oxygen will synchronize and we will all breathe in <laughs> at the same time, and that's what happens, you know. Yeah. 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 It's it's like if you line up a load of metronomes together, they'll eventually sync. Even if, even if you're in different countries. Uh, definitely. Oh, yeah. Nice. yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the the past is a different country, Shane. Yeah. What? what what else have you got on that PDF uh, to see who should know after seeing it? Uh, what else have you got there, Steve? Uh, I think we've exhausted oh, wow. everything okay. except for Fra- Frank Zappa and Mother's Invention. But we have one thing. Uh, it's a segment that we didn't use last time that we can try and do now. Um, if we all just talk about a book, piece of music, art, movie, and television, podcast, oh, or food wow. that we're into at the moment. Oh. So let's t- let's start with books, Paul. Um, what what are you reading at the moment? What are you into? Um, I've just started uh, Patty Smith's book N. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. it's a good and M train. Yeah, I, I had read her last one, Just Kids. Oh, so um, fantastic! I I thought I would like it more. I need to go back to really? it. Really, th- uh. but but I thought it was just I don't know because I, I I kind of exhausted reading a lot about New York stuff. Yeah, I, I was just um, and then I, I just I didn't I didn't get it as much as I, I should have, you know. Mm. And, um, so I left it. I said I'll come back to it now. I'll give it some time. And then I got the um, M book, and it was just basically her, you know, talking about visiting. Uh, cafes around the world just really sort of long bits about how she sits down to write and I says well this is absolutely not me this is the worst thing ever it was a piece <laughs> of it, didn't it? so anyway I read it and I started reading it and it's absolutely fantastic it just caught, caught me on the hop it's like really mm. passing by and hearing a piece of music that you know, from a genre that you didn't think you'd be into it, and it just oh, yeah. blows you away. So I, I, I love when that happens. So I'm, though, yeah, no, know? I thought I was a bit, yeah. I thought I was a bit burnt out, uh, and I was a bit older for that. But um, it, it's still there, which is which is great. I got the same thing from Burroughs, actually. I, I you know, the, the yeah. second I read it, it, was like, oh my god, okay, this makes complete sense. But um, the pace of it is fantastic, and it's it's the best kind of, you know writing i suppose you know reading sort of long reviews and the kind of the guardian and things like that they, they review a lot of those kind of kind of poetry uh, you know uh, balano and things like that and I, I just can't get into it because time is just kind of attacking me all the time and you know like life, mm. life is just the pace and everything like that i just don't have the time to focus i didn't think i had time for that but yeah i've just started and it, it, it's it's fantastic it's a some lovely early bits in it about her her um, deep kind of love for for Fred Sonic Smith of the MC Fives, mm, and mm-hmm. um, the idea that you know she wants to go and he, like he teaches her fishing and things like that and it starts by her in a cafe and she just intensely you know she really gets you know the whole atmosphere of a a proper place where you're sitting down by yourself and. Um, you know, eventually, like she says, you know, I'll, I'll help you buy this cafe. Uh, the, the young guy serving is going to open up his own place, and then all these things. And you know, just lovely little bits because she's traveling around the place, and um, mm. you know, every place she goes, she kind of has a quiet moment. So she made actually the book as far as I can get. I've only started it. She's made the book about um, writing about being in those places, which on paper, excuse the pun, is like. You know that's not going to be very good uh, <laughs> but you know she goes to places where um she said she has her father's chair her father used to work nights and yeah. um uh, he only had his time at the weekend so he just watched baseball and sit in the chair with his bible and uh he had a, a, a sort of cigarette box with different kinds of things and she looks into that sometimes you know but she never sits in the father's chair she has it in her apartment you know well, she, sat, she sat in something. I think it's. Uh, I think it's actually uh, Roberto Bolano as a, 
um, chair in Barcelona and she was like oh she just felt really bad you know she just felt oh I shouldn't have sat there you know it's like what was I expecting you know to channel some of it so because, sympathetic magic yeah you know? so you know she yeah. said she, she felt like that wasn't her place to be doing that so she, she oh yeah I, I saw know. her at Pori Jazz actually uh, two years ago it was she, fantastic she does, you she know she was on a great show she doesn't show. sit in her father's chair but she looks across at it so I thought that was that's the end that's as far now as I'm in into the book so that's that's my mm -hmm. book Shane, what are you reading at the moment? Um, I am reading uh, all the what, is, what the fuck is the name of the book? Oh, uh, this it's called This Freedom by Tony Parsons. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's kind of one of those like uh, it's fairly successful attempt to kind of do this kind of post atheism, post spirituality, like not exactly science kind of thing. Sounds kind of woo, -woo but it's like not woo, woo at all. It's like incredibly logical kind of. Uh, talks on the nature of reality basically it's just all culled from a bunch of lectures he's given and oh, um, nice. yeah it just fucking blows my mind i'm just reading it on, on the subway every now and that's the only the only time i get to read is on the subway yeah uh, same i only get to read one shane is he is well. he the tony parsons the tabloid writer over here no there's two there's two of them and okay it's thank god thank you that's great that's yeah, really you. good. good. It scared, it's scared like the me whole there thing for with a John Snow from Channel yeah, Four and John Snow a, from Game of Thrones. For a second, yeah. for a second Paul, I got very excited because when I heard you go, I was like, "Oh, do you know him as well?" Cause no, that like was a that was an av that was an av concern. Okay. Oh, all right, uh, fair yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> you reassured yeah. me. I'm I'm reading uh, Bicycle Diaries. Uh, well, I, f I finished it, uh, David Burns' book, and I also finished uh, this Joe Hadleman short stories book. Uh, so now I have nothing to That's read. That's two you're showing uh, off, okay? Yeah. Well, I, I, I have one, I read them in different situations, so did, they just synced up that I finish reading them at the same time. Steve, did, oh, you, did, um, you, did you read How Music Works, the David Byrne book? Yeah, I've read it three times. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. It's fantastic. Yeah, I had a, I found a PDF of it. Yeah. Um, and then I I got it from the library. Read it. There was the they updated it for the paperback, and uh, it's pretty good. It's really good. But uh, Bicycle Diaries is great too. You know, yeah. I mean, um, it talk, talks a lot about music too. You know, uh, less about like uh, you know, there's a good bit about stop making sense and this whole um, Japanese theater and this comparative thing in uh, how music works but Bicycle Diaries is great because like every chapter is a city and he kind of like explores it from the, that perspective and there's, there's a really strong like ecological theme to it uh, which is you know I wasn't really expecting because I thought like I, I don't know what I thought, but it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's well, it sounds, it's sounds like good. it's got a bit of a parallel to that Paddy Smith book, you know, these different locations around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, he, he's got great discipline. Uh, like metronomes, Bern, guys. Bern is great because uh, he doesn't, uh, you know, he used to get a, a bit of a hard time in before the internet and you'd read, oh, he's just been arty and all this kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. And the band actually uh, had bits. I remember when they broke up, I saw Tom Tom Club in, in Dublin in about 87 and something like that, and they were shouting for talking heads songs and Tina Weymouth goes no David's not here he's in Brazil uh, <laughs> where the nuts come from and, uh, but he was he was you know he was making Brazilian stuff and he has his own Luca Bach yeah Ray Momo yeah. it's a great album fantastic yeah, yeah, album I think, yeah, yeah so so that's good the one the book by Byrne he's a book in PowerPoint yeah he has a he has an art performance on PowerPoint where he does a <laughs> he uses all PowerPoint animations to make this uh, he talks about it in Bicycle Diaries as well, well. I heard Sounds I heard great. it was a book I've been trying to find it I heard it was a he has a book I didn't yeah, know it was a book I was remembered in David Byrne's book on PowerPoint and um, I, you know it might be a, oh so I'm, now, I, now, now I have that on my list and Bicycle Diaries yeah. is hard enough to find yeah um, there's yeah. another good thing for, for uh, Talking Heads people they just put up online BBC um, Arena they have a documentary on um, the when they were recording Fear of Music, and uh, it's it's I, I just got that on vinyl the other just, day. Oh yeah, it's, it's great, but it's a really Rhino. really good documentary, yeah. and it's just really good, and the music is fantastic, and it's just you know it's, God, you know they were so good, they were just so fucking good. Like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Jerry Harrison's own stuff is quite yes, good as it well. Is, actually. Um, yeah, it's, um, Casual Gods, isn't it? Yeah, Casual Gods, mm. great album. Yeah. I only have it on MP3. Well, actually, no, it's not true. I have it on uh, the Something Wild OST uh, vinyl that I picked well, up. Well, here, here's a nerd point: is one of the biggest hip hop uh, influences was uh, Wild Style. It was the the, the film Wild Style. You, you might know that chain. Um, it's a big um, New York kind of icon of hip hop. But uh, Jerry Harrison did did the music on that. Some of the most did he? Oh, nice. 
baselines on um, that that the ori- like there was only a certain amount of records that people were kind of doubling up and scratching on a hip hop kind of thing back in uh, God it must have been 1979 1980 um, but yeah, mm-hmm. Jerry Harrison is there and that you know oh so, sweet uh, it was good you know uh, which we made a perfect segue into music what are you listening to at the moment Shane oh fuck uh, Jesus um, can, can can I go after you Steve. <laughs> Uh, I, can't, I can't remember <laughs> anything I'm listening to right now. <laughs> That's all right. Um, what am I listening to at the moment? Uh, revisiting a lot of stuff. Um, I'm actually listening to a lot of like kind of South American music at the moment. Sa- sad American? Sa- South oh. American. <laughs> <laughs> sad American. That's an interesting genre. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, partially because of Bicycle Diaries. Uh, also listening to Ray Momo and then this, you know, kind of the musicians that he was collaborate with, David Byrne was collaborating with and like, um, you know, try, kind of seeking them out. And also uh, the Something Wild OST, which I've been listening to like every week for the past year now. Um, there's some like uh, not on the actual record, but on the unofficial OST that you can find on YouTube. There's a lot of like kind of flamenco and tango music and stuff on that. It's quite good. Uh, there's some interesting stuff, you know. Um, really puts a bit of uh, kick in your step when you're walking. Um, you know, I can see what drew David Byrne to it. I don't know how long I'll be listening to it. I'm also listening to Blonde Redhead again, uh, just because, you know, I, I can't let go of certain things. <laughs> What are you listening to, Paul? Um, I going back over a lot of stuff, but mainly uh, the one that jumps out at the moment is uh, a lot of Cabaret Voltaire, um, mm. because I um, I have a shed out the back that's kind of collapsing with a few records, and I just realised there's clumps of stuff that I got together to put together in in sequence. So I have all the Cabaret Voltaire stuff, and I'm just like just constantly because as a kid when I was when I first came across them, you know they were just you know, just out there. Um, and I was, I, I listened to them again, like, um, um, like Drinking Gasoline uh, is one album and um, The Crackdown and things like that about when they got money, um, the the pressure was on them to make hits, you know, because they had a mm. sensoria and things like that. And I can just feel the tension in the album where they had to make tracks you know, where you, you'd have, you know, and I, I was just thinking about this the other day. If I had time, I'd actually go back and re-edit a lot of them just to make kind of longer edits. And I have the uh, I have the 12 inches as well, but um, I just they got hypnotic right. And um, they, they're just just brilliantly uh, abrasive in, in the right way. And that whole kind of huge burrows people, you know, so the cut ups and, mm. and all this kind of thing. And uh, but just the, the noise still never left me. It, it's like Iggy Pop and um, uh, I Want to Be Your Dog. You know, I could play that every day or I could play um, uh, Joy Division, Dead Souls. And it's one of those, you know, as you get older, uh, I suppose the, that, the you, you, both, you kind of both of what you mentioned are yeah. great music for the gym, by the way. Just yeah, it, it's you know, <laughs> it, it's th- those songs that never the, the, the second you heard them. You know, as you get older, you think, well, if I had to take 10 albums with me, it's the ones that you always play that, you know, just get you the same time as the first time you heard them, you know. And mm. um, so Cabaret Voltaire have always been like that uh, for me. You know, I I, I met Adrian Sherwood once, um, the, the dub producer, the famous guy, you know, and uh, we were talking about one extreme cut up album called um, Major Malfunction by Keith LeBlanc. And um, it's it's based on the Challenger disaster, and it's got actually Bur- yeah, Burrows really. again. It actually features Burrows' voice, you know. And he told me great stories about making that, about how they were actually recording it while they were mixing upstairs, and the guy in the studio was a Scientologist, and he was convinced that he was been spied on. So the whole um, the whole studio was wired because he was trying to like see was anybody talking about him, and they were making this album about paranoia while being in a paranoid situation. Mm-hmm. And um, so that 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 it was the same time as the Cabaret Voltaire uh, things anyway. But then I anyway I threw out to myself. By the way, I said just before I forget, you have a um, you Sherwood, my hero, uh, actually did a mix of a, uh, a Cabaret Voltaire song 
uh, my other heroes, you know, and he just goes, uh, really? And I says, yeah, it's just 1997. Oh, I bet it was shit, he says. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Cabaret Voltaire, that's my, that's my top pick for today, you know. Cool. Shane, what are you listening to? Have you made up your mind? I've made up my mind. I've curated a list of uh, three perfect things that I think I would like people to judge me on. Um, cool. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm going to see um, a band called Liturgy soon uh, play. They're like... Um, they call themselves transcendental black metal, so you might actually be interested in, in them in terms of research. The guy wrote a thesis on on the genre, and uh, mm-hmm. Vice just totally lambasted him. So he's like this marmite kind of artist at the moment, like um, either you kind of love <laughs> or hate. Um, but but they just mm-hmm. do this. They do they do this weird fucking like spoken word, um, uber lo-fi, um, like speed death metal stuff. Um, and is it marmite is, metal? Then, it's Steve. it's it's yeah. it's a little bit marmite metally i think yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. and that's you know, now officially a genre you've christian you've christened that you know it's just made a genre that's how it happens that's how it happens on fucking podcasts yeah but yeah they're, they're one of those bands i have tickets to see them soon and i feel like they're it's you know it'll be a great band to catch because it's not like something that comes along very often they kind of feel like sure. maybe like they make break up after the next record Sure, and, yeah. um, as we were talking about hip hop, um, fucking Kendrick Lamar's to pimp a butterfly, um, you know, like that came out, la- what is it, last year now? Yeah, and uh, like just to the biggest hype, tra- like kind of, not 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 overground hype train, but underground hype train, and it was like this is going to be the best thing in the world. Mm. But now that that's died down, I've actually been able to like listen to it a bit more in depthly, and it's just got all this amazing jazz and soul back yeah but Sh- shane you know he's just released the outtakes from that yeah uh, the unmastered as, untitled yeah the un- untitled album. masters yeah. which is everybody's saying is like you know that's pretty good as two you know so he's yeah he's, this, he's on a roll like, all right he really is I, I need to i need to investigate him you should, I, you, I just, i'll send you some stuff because it's just yeah, so that'd be great it's man so fucking good and but the legally we'll send it you like buy it and send it to me in a, in a i'll, I'll wrap it up and like put a put yeah a yeah legally we'll but I'll, I'll, I'll give you money Checking for it that's that you can give to the record company the record now now we are safe yeah um, but I just want to quickly double around there as well. Um, we were just talking a little bit about hip hop earlier on, and the way there is still like a huge, like here, we're talking about the underground hip hop, there's a bit of like a, still a striving for like in a lot of, uh, with those artists of like this kind of bling uh, thing. But there's been an amazing bunch of documentaries that came out recently, and I'm not, I like Vice pisses me off uh, as much as I enjoy it sometimes, but they've done a bunch in um, California. And there's yeah, all these, there's all these, yeah, they're so amazing. Like you know, like Frank Ocean mm. and all these guys, and um, uh, some of the other guys from the Odd Future group. Like a lot of those guys are sober um, teenagers growing up in re- like Kendrick Lamar is straight edge, and like they're growing up in really rough neighborhoods, but they refuse to like smoke weed or drink or anything like mm. that. And they're like writing about depression and stuff like that. It's like mm. the, the the machismo, the macho um, idea of what it is to be a rapper, like an above board rapper, is like totally being fucked with at the moment and that's like really yeah it's, an, it's a new epoch within the genre yeah, yeah there's uh, just, just, yeah. just drop that manly manhood shit and just um be who you are kind of thing it's really mm. really inspiring well they did yeah um, the, the gay the kind the gay angle as well that was getting a bit of traction as well because you know um that kind of strain embraced i mean the odd what the the, the female dj in odd future oh um, yeah what's her name uh she's she's yeah, but you know, and 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 quite out. So that was quite revolutionary that they were, you know, they were bigging that up. And so yeah, they they did. They get a lot. I, I think. I mean, your your man that um, what's that crazy guy who's head of them? Um, oh, uh, 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 golf. Ty- Tyler, 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 Tyler. Uh, you know, took a bit of a kind of like. Well, he got so much traction from this. He immediately tried to, you know, make money on socks he sells a lot of socks it seems yeah like. he's, got and, t- he's, uh, got a, he's got a tv show he's got key rings you know yeah you know it's it's, it's like okay I, i've seen what people are looking at and um I, I don't think that that kind of real revolutionary um angle that they they were respected for got enough traction uh, got enough time to develop but maybe you know maybe it only had his peak and they went back into to to being underground as well and uh, it certainly does give a, it reminds me a lot of goth actually because um, yeah yeah for people like you know you, you come across all these goth bands and you know I, mm. I, i'm at a time where any band came out it got a certain time in radio and a certain amount of reviews and um 
then all these bands fell off but then they got huge followings by people who said oh you spoke to me i'm going to follow you forever you know so maybe that's the case with with that if it's just a comparison to let's say pre-internet times but um i i i, I kind of keep an eye on that because uh, years ago i was kind of following and i was writing on it a bit as well like you know just putting up long sort of posts but um, I, it seems to have dropped off my radar anyway, you know, Tyler particularly, once Tyler started getting a bit annoying for in terms of like, well, you know, this is tied into my brand, you got to buy my brand, you know, and buy my yeah. stuff. And, and then he was like, he, he put up a post and he was like, he'd be, he'd be managed or something like that. And he was saying like, major companies, you can now um, uh, sort of buy into my creativity by giving me... Um, you know, I will be your creative director for anything you want, you know. So some Snapple or something, give them a few <laughs> bit, of, bit, of, bit of money. And what he turned out yeah. was so freaky that they just, they just <laughs> pulled the whole thing. It was shown a few times and he didn't get much uh, ads after that. That's like Chumbawamba selling the rights to I get knocked down, I get up again to like a car company, which is kind of confusing that they would buy <laughs> that, getting knocked down again. But then they, they used the, yeah. all of the proceeds from from that to finance a load of PSAs that were anti-car industry, I think. Oh, yeah. You know, I, is, I, I, yeah. yeah that, that, you'd be down at that. you got to use the system as well like that. I mean, it was it was yeah. simpler It was simpler to kind of uh, do that kind of thing, you know. I mean, I, hear, I well, hear satisfaction by the Rolling Stones like more times on ads than I ever thought it would, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no such thing as selling out anymore for an independent no, artist. No. It's impossible to make money. It's impossible. No, it's to just live. called surviving. Yeah, it's exactly. Well, yeah. it's 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 post capitalism as well. It's 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 hyper capitalism. It's just the idea that that doesn't really matter anymore because it's actually saturated so much that to get your voice in is a kind of step in your creativity. So what it it takes to uh, to get into that space is kind of legitimate. Um. So it's it's it doesn't it just makes you know my generation kind of just drop out a bit on us, you know, and um, hmm. actually it makes my generation look back at, you know, did we really give the people like, I suppose, Chumbawamba maybe enough, <laughs> enough credit, a credit on, on what they were doing, you know? Maybe, Definitely uh, not. Yeah. It comes back to, I'll just throw in there, it comes back to Crass. Crass, you know, that's basically, Crass had that kind of thing going on, uh, self-sufficiency, you know, post hippie Yeah, stuff. now you can buy a Crass T-shirt and American Apparel. You know. Well, you know, that was that was they didn't they didn't go for that. But yeah, no, they didn't they didn't go for that at all. It's yeah, yeah, it's probably, uh, yeah. Um, art. Uh, what type of what 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 stands out to you recently? Something you've seen in person? Something you've seen online? Um, uh, Paul. Oh, okay. Anything you um, want to acknowledge? Uh, well, I'm 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 actually back teaching fine art full time as um, in the last couple mm. of years because I spent a lot of time working in in, in Bizcom because um, um, I like the discipline, you know. I like the fact that you yeah. could actually do anything, and it was kind of programmed into a certain sort of format, which had to, a lot of discipline. It's more mer- meritocracy than um, than art. Well, you just way. you know, as a kind of you know dealing with uh, creatives, and you know, there's just responsibility because you had to get out to the to the to the, to the, um, to the audience. You had to make a thing, you know. And then I, I, I taught uh, in, in between um, social practice, and um, you know, there was a, a general kind of you know. Uh, making sure the reception for the audience was very much tied into what you wanted to do. But um, mm-hmm. I, I find, um, like, so I'm researching an awful lot of art to keep, you know, to keep uh, fresh um, um, references for, for the students, you know. And um, I, I'm getting a bit, I'm getting a bit kind of exhausted with it, actually, because um, uh, it's, it's ooh, you know, I'll be contentious with myself, I suppose, here and uh, as well as been, you know, been caught. But I, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of first world problems here with, with, uh, <laughs> yeah. with, with, with yeah. fine art, you know, and things. But I have to say uh, the piece that struck me, there's two pieces um, I'll throw out. One is um, um, who's got the, it's, it's in New York, I think, at the moment, mm. um, Shane. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. she, she researched and she went to a lot of prisons. Uh, or e- e- either one prison, and she she's the 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 artist who does the museums. You know, she she does a lot of uh, work about uh, you know just the idea of the museum. She had a performance piece where she pretended to be a a, a museum kind of uh, guide, and she would literally get groups of people and point to some sort of painting or something like that and completely make up stuff. I'm I'm doing that <laughs> today, but I, I really liked her. And, and I saw a piece yeah. in, in Berlin she did where. Um, she uh, took this very famous German artist who I constantly forget because um, I'm so blown away by the work. But he gave a speech. It was a video of him giving a speech, 
and he was completely drunk and he was making racist comments and Hitler and everything like that. <laughs> so she learned German and um, she recreated the performance of him just kind of giving a speech at his opening or something like that, you know, just showing this big thing. But anyway, it, it's, it's a completely empty space and this huge, this huge space, I don't know if it's a gallery per se or is it just a large kind of warehouse, uh, massive space in a building or mm. used to be office and like that but all there's nothing in it but all you hear is the sound the sound of the prisons and of course that would be something oh wow that people wouldn't expect yeah. and just the simplicity of that i thought was 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 very very strong and uh, sounds so that's, fantastic that's yeah thing. but but i i did see I, w I was with some people there uh, briefly on on in limerick here on, on saturday and um uh, of course, many things I love about Limerick, but one of the things is like, so I'm with a guy who's got a PhD in sound design. I'm with someone else who's like a, uh, a designer for web design or something like that. But, you know, if you walked into Nancy's, you would not see that in your radar. You would just see kind of three lads who had obviously had loads of experience drinking before. And um, mm -hmm. um, guy goes to another guy who works in the bank and um, says, uh, show him, show him the, the pictures, you know. And uh, he showed me the series of pictures on his phone. Not an artist, but he showed me a few pictures on his phone. And the first one starts is uh, my friend came over and, they, you know, he did a lovely house and everything like that. And he's, he's really into cooking. So he, he shows me this first image and it, it's just a picture of a glass of wine. And then the second picture is this friend who was, um, who was actually a private investigator. And he shows a, a, a picture of a, um, a, um, a him acknowledging with another glass of wine. And he says, and then the next picture was a um, beautiful sort of salmon on a dish or something like that. And we had our d'oeuvres. And he kept showing me the time on this. He says, this is 3.01. And then at 3.45 in the afternoon, there was another sort of meal. And these beautiful pictures of, you know, lo lovely food prepared. And then after that, we had a like a full sort of uh, brazen beef and stuff like like that, you know, and that's about maybe four twenty five, you know, and uh, the next one is um, on my pal went, oh, yeah, here's here's where the gunshot happens. And I was like, what? And it says, well, I went into the kitchen to get something else. But in the meantime, my friend has said just previously, he says, like, is that a bottle of, of rum? And he says, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with wine, you know, help yourself and something like that, you know. So there was a lapse in time. And then he said, I, I heard this gunshot or something. So I rushed in and um, there was my friend collapsed on the on the ground. And all, he showed me the picture and I jumped back because the whole place was splattered with blood. And I said, of course, he had drank so much that he had dropped his wine and a full glass and rum or something like that. But the texture of the, of the actual red had splattered the whole place. And then wow. there was a series of pictures of him looking like he was murdered. And then there was a series of pictures of when the other friend called the taxi to get him out. So he's in the garden, again, dead to the world. And then he's kind of fighting back and getting photographed. And then he's put in the taxi, you know, and he says, well, that was the day that was the day it happened. And I just went home and I went, that is absolutely probably the best piece of art I've seen this year. Just the way that it wasn't supposed to happen. And the guy said, just to keep his own sanity and, of course, to hang him afterwards you know to say look at the state of you afterwards you know but the way they put it together and the way he was able to talk about it with the time code and of course the phone was so good quality that all the pictures were you could just basically print them you know and mm -hmm. um i was i was thinking that that is and that's never and i was actually thinking about saying well could i get them as prints just for myself i won't show them or i like, think you know but i could just see them yeah. in the sequence and when you look at all these kind of um I suppose starting out from Tracy Emin and Sarah Lucas and, and that, that that Brit thing art and you know the amount of New York stuff as well, Shane. You would know that constantly keeps coming up about you know dash snow and all this kind of thing. Yeah. And, and then I saw this is a guy who's not an artist and you know this is life as it is in the 21st century, and these are guys who have like worked all week and why can't they meet? You know, called over. What's happening? Well, you know, both of them are really into food. You know, you wouldn't think, mm. it, but they know like um, they were able to describe how he was able to describe about because he led me down a good path because I was like, this is a really good cheese. He says, like, look at the picture there. Of course, the dressing is very good as well at that. So normally in your Guardian reading uh, uh, lifestyle, you would see all oh, this. The end, the, you know, the evening ended brilliant with some lovely stories. No, the, the evening ended with his sitting room still to this day. It happened a month ago, decorated. It looks like <laughs> a murder scene. 
And a taxi driver that probably is dying to kill the guy, because I'd say, knowing the guys I do, he probably ran away once he sobered up, if he possibly did once he got home, you know. And uh, then that was last week, and God knows what will happen next week. Nothing might happen for things, you know. So that kind of, how do you document the rhythm? So thinking about, like, the, the environment of people who have to, you have to go to work and to make a living, and then, you know, we just have this kind of environment where we just want to, like, we really like each other and let's just have fun and... You know, but it doesn't have to be a few cans out in the back of a, a, a field. It's like this happens actually in, you know, middle, middle class environments. And uh, but the idea of just being able to frame it in such a way that when you could, you know, meet your friends, I want to show you this. You know, I, I thought it was there's something there. There's something there. I have to work it out. Sorry, I went on a bit there. That's, <laughs> well, that's, that's okay. Sounds great. great. I think uh, that's our heart out now. Um, I have to close up shop. Is there anything you'd like to uh, talk about, Shane, quickly? Uh, no, I just want to comment a little bit on what Paul said there. Just um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Like I was, I was gonna. My answer was gonna be uh, most like I'm sick of. I'm like all arted out at the moment. But the the best mm. pieces of art I've seen haven't been in galleries and stuff like that. You know, it's it's uh, yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you, gents. Um, I'll just finish as well by adding, I'm trying to get this video of our trip to France when I was uh, nine years old, and we got an early um, VHS uh, tape recorder, and uh, my father um, thought that the red light meant that it was off. So uh, yeah. we, have, uh, we have footage of my father's uh, feet gradually becoming more and more sunburned in his sandals <laughs> as we as we walk around uh, Brittany. Um, so that's something I'm trying to get access to at the moment. But that's our kid. That's the best that's, that's, that's the best piece of art you've seen so far. Uh, I mean like I, I can only see it in my memory, but my mother transfer transferred it to D V D. She got a guy in town to do it. So I think that's in the post to me now. All right, guys, I think that's uh, all we have time for. Steve, Steve I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you very much. It's been fantastic. For Hang you on a second. I'll follow. It's a pleasure. Someplace. And Shane, it's great to talk to you again, Shane. I haven't seen you what? in years, and uh, I, I oh, look yeah, forward to, look forward to, to to seeing you again and, and hearing about New York. It's great, and looking forward to seeing you again, Steve. And God love you. Uh, keep the work up. You're fantastic workers. You too, Paul. You okay. too. Yeah. Okay. Signing off. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Signing all the best, Paul. See you. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye. 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 bye, bye. Okay, guys, thanks for listening again, if you did listen to the first one. It's really nice to be able to produce this and to get such nice feedback that we did last time. I uh, really wasn't expecting it. Um, the Many thanks to Paul Tarpey, um, who was our guest on this episode. Um, my apologies for the uh, kind of choppiness at the end there. We were kind of experiencing some technical... Uh, sound atmospheric contamination it's mostly due to how we do this recording like we're doing this in three different countries so we're still working out the bugs it's not like we've got really expensive equipment we're probably doing it in a very low-tech way and there's probably a smarter way but you know i can't throw an extra grand at this this is something we're doing in our free time um the famine of knowledge was produced by steve maher intro music was by ost which is a.k.a. Shane Harrington.
also uh, the Famine of Knowledge is hosted, co-hosted by Shane Harrington and Steve Maher. Special guest this week was Paul Tarpey. The next couple of episodes we hope to have some really interesting guests, including some previous collaborators in many different guises, disguises, whatever you want to pick. Um, this is the third time I've recorded this outro, mostly because the last few times I've kept saying the phantom of knowledge. I really have George Lucas on my mind at the moment. Anyway, I'll let you play out with some waves. Peace.